Welcome into another edition of Talking Ducks. As always, a lot to get to. We've got more interviews from the signing night live, including Oregon Athletic Director Rob Mullins. We'll also hear from former cornerback Verone McKinley, and then we'll talk about some of our favorite ducks of all time and six Oregon Ducks getting their NFL Combine invite. But let's talk about basketball in the last week, and it's time now for our opening tip brought to you by Les Schwab Tire Centers, where they've been doing the right thing since 1952. Both the Oregon men and women getting swept by the Washington schools this week. And let's start on the men's side. Coming into their road trip up north, Oregon was hoping to try and win out all five games, and they were still right there on the bubble for the NCAA tournament. But after losses to both Washington and Washington State, the Oregon men are still right there on the bubble for the NCAA tournament. They're part of the next four out right now for the bracketology reports when you take a look at it, whether it's first four out, next four out, they're out. But the good news for the Oregon men, they're sixth place in the conference sitting at 9-8. and eight. The two teams above them, Arizona State and Utah, are 10-7. and seven. Why is that important? Well, the Oregon men are trying to get that four seed at the Pac-12 tournament, meaning you skip the first day of games and you now just have to win three games in three days if you want the automatic bid. Oregon still has a really good chance to get that four spot. The remaining games are at home against the Bay Area schools, very winnable games. On the road at Oregon State this week, though, that'll be a tough one for the Ducks. they got to try and make sure they take care of business at Gill Coliseum. Arizona State has the three hardest road games remaining possible in the conference. At the LA schools at Arizona, and then Utah still has got at the LA schools that they have to go to. Plus, Oregon has the tiebreaker over Utah. So, if you followed all that, the Oregon men are still in a decent position to make it to the NCAA tournament. They're going to have to win out in the regular season and get a game in Vegas to give themselves the best chance, to be honest. But there's some other teams above them that could also stub their toes. But this is when you keep an eye on teams having surprising upset wins in their conference tournament and stealing some of these at-large bids. So for Dana Altman and company, obviously two difficult losses, but there's still hope. Now for the Oregon women, believe it or not, there is still some hope. But this seven-game losing streak is the longest in the Kelly Graves era. Let's go ahead and hear from him after their most recent loss. What I am most proud of of this team, I, I know we're on a, on a losing streak. You couldn't tell by just being around them. I, I think their chemistry off the court's been great. I think they're having fun. They're probably having more fun in the locker room and stuff before the game. They're energized. I, they're doing the right things. They, we have the right tenor. It's not translating, unfortunately, on the court in wins. Um, so I'm proud of them for that. They, no, nobody's thrown in the towel. My staff, they're still grinding. They're still doing the, um, you know, uh, the, their due diligence, and, and we're working on the next opponent. I think they've compartmentalized that pretty well. What's next? We've only talked about Thursday. I, about a month ago or three weeks ago, I kind of gave them the big picture. This is what I think we need to do. And I'm not sure that helped. So we've now taken an approach of we can only worry about Thursday night's game. And I think if we can get Thursday night's game, I'm going to feel a lot better about Sunday. We'll feel a lot better about going into the Pac-12 tournament. I think we're going to end up being one of those teams. If we can get into the field, and there's still a chance for us to get into the field, we're going to be one of those teams nobody's going to want to play. We're going to be a high seed, low seed. I don't know. High number. High number. A high-numbered seed that – Somebody, if we're in their bracket, they're going to go, dang, I, I, you know, we, we drew the short straw. So, um, and we've been there before, you know, uh, as, as a coach, I think, you know, you're, you're the, the guy that looks at records. You know, I think I've won eight or nine, ten games as a double-digit seed in the NCAA tournament. That doesn't happen very often. Maybe it's never happened. So we can, if we can just get in there, I think we have the experience to, you know, um, to be able to get our kids to, to, to believe that, hey, we can do, do some damage. Obviously, it's been a disappointing season for Kelly Graves over the last couple of weeks, how things have kind of spiraled out of control. But you have to remember, the Pac-12 might see seven, possibly eight teams get NCAA tournament bids. This is a stacked conference. It's no longer just Stanford leading the way. You have two top four programs in Stanford and Utah. Arizona's been playing very well this year. UCLA and USC have been very, very good. And Oregon State has always has been solid. So it's been tough sledding in conference play for the Oregon women. Plus, 
you've got a lot of roster turnover this year. These are pieces that are really going to step up and continue to gel even more next year. And sometimes these young players have to go through the fire in order to understand what they need to do to win these games next year. These are a lot of close winnable games that they're dropping. But obviously, for Kelly Graves, they have to win out. And the writing's pretty clear on the wall that this is a team that now needs to have a lot of things go their way if they want to try and find their way into the women's NCAA tournament. Hopefully Hoops can turn things around this upcoming week, but when we come back, we'll have a chance to have a great sit-down interview with Rob Mullins, Oregon Athletic Director, about his tenure at Oregon and having to go through five head coaches in football over the past 10 years. We're just getting started on Talking Ducks. We'll have more when we come back. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back to Talking Ducks. Time now for some excellence off the field presented by Ferguson Wellman. Ferguson Wellman, a disciplined approach to investing. And we get a chance to catch up with Rob Mullins, the AD, and ask him kind of the state of the athletic department and how he feels coming into the second year of Dan Lanning. There's Dan Lanning and then there's his boss, <laughs> Oregon <laughs> Athletic Director Rob Mullins. And Rob, let me start with this. Where's the stress level now compared to last year when you're going through a coaching hire and trying to make, you know, arguably one of the biggest decisions an athletic director can make when it comes to personnel involving the school? Now a whole year's gone by. How do you reflect on this past year? Well, it's been a successful year. I mean, 10 win seasons are tough yeah. to come by, you know, obviously. And then, you know, to, to be able to have 10 wins in a transition year, and you know, adapt to this new environment. When you look back, you know, this whole portal thing is new, NIL yep. is new, mm -hmm. and you look at the role some of those transfers played in the success of that 10 win season, mm -hmm. you know, all in all, it's a great foundation. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I won't say blown away, but I was surprised to remember that you've been here a decade now. Yeah. Like it's, it's been a long time. And I'm, and I'm looking back at, I mean, it's a heck of a celebration, right? What can you remember about walking into here and then the journey that it's taken to get to where we are now? Because we were a very different program at that time, kind of in transition, and, and you've, you've really kind of steered this ship. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, just like all of us talk about in the journey, right, it's the people. And, you know, what, what was so unique instantly when you get to Oregon is how much passion there was. Um, and how everybody was all in on making Oregon great. And then obviously, you know, what Coach Brooks did, and then Coach Bellotti built on it, and then Chip kind of changed football uh, with his offense. And, you know, because of that innovation, the relationship with Nike, all the great players who played here and gave back, it allowed all of our other sports to really kind of take off right in the wake of that football visibility and that football success. Mm -hmm. And we've been able to see a lot of our other Olympic sports mm -hmm. elevated because of the football visibility and success. You know, I know you have several challenges doing your job. Uh, one challenge is to keep a head coach because when, when, when a coach is good, everybody's looking at him. And if we go back in the day with Rich Brooks being here forever, Mike Bellotti being here forever, even Chip Kelly was here for a while, now they're kind of coaches are looking too. Coaches are, are taking off. How do you keep a coach? How do you and when he's doing the right thing, when he's doing good things? Right. It's really difficult, right? Because when you look at, I, I, you know, when I first got hired at Oregon, Chip had just gone to the Rose Bowl mm -hmm. um, and had virtually no buyout. So we were working on a renegotiated contract while I was still living in Lexington, Kentucky. <laughs> and I think at the time, Chip was making $1.6 million. Yeah. So we change. Have, no, we, have, we have coordinators <laughs> making more than $1.6 million. And it's getting increasingly difficult yeah. because the rules are being deregulated yep. that allow you to do more, whether that's additional headcount, mm -hmm. more for student athletes. And so it's become more and more of a resource game. Mm -hmm. And when you look at where salaries have gone, size of staffs has gone, mm -hmm. the one thing that we still have is an incredibly passionate fan base, mm -hmm. a great quality of life, and a brand that will allow you to compete for Pac-12 championships and even more, CFP opportunities, New Year's Six Bowls. So it's difficult yeah. uh, because the game has changed. Um, we have head coaches in college football making more than NFL head yeah. coaches now. It, it, um, and, and resources are playing more and more of a role, which doesn't always feel great. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it is interesting. Everything you bring up and then you throw NIL in there and you have escalating costs for everything, your coaching staffs, 
now it's players and a lot of those dollars that were coming into athletic department fundraising firms that would then disperse it are now, you know, honestly going to players. Where is the end game with this? It's probably impossible to predict, but where do you see this going? Because at a certain point, right, these TV contracts can only support so much of this growth. Right. It's hard to predict, really, and it's yeah. uh, it's it's a it's a bit of chaos right now when you yeah. think about transfer portal, mm -hmm. NIL. Again, and there's lots of other deregulation happening that doesn't doesn't always get in the headlines. Um, you know, we're going to be allowed to do more visits. Um, you know, more meals. You know, we had the Alston ruling where we can now give an academic achievement uh -huh. and, you know, cash. Yeah. Um, you know, so all those add up. Um, and so I don't know I where it been, ends. I could have been short answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think you made it out all right. They didn't have that rookie wage cap when you got drafted. Man. But, uh, and, and along those lines, too, you know, we've talked about the different head coaches. Five head coaches in your tenure. That's a lot of coaches, yet the program has continued to maintain success. From your perspective, how has Oregon football, regardless of who's on the sidelines with that headset, been able to stay at this point competitively for so long? Yeah, when you look at it, you know, we've had multiple coaches win Pac-12 championships, multiple coaches mm -hmm. in Rose Bowls. You know, I think we have a formula that works, right? We have very passionate people. Mm -hmm. We have an outstanding community, a unique relationship with Nike, incredible facilities, and a brand that people embrace. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's you know, 85% of our scholarship student athletes are from out of state. Um, so that brand reach uh, is a big help. But again, there's been this incredible foundation laid by by people like you, Coach Brooks, Coach Pilati, and they're always there to help. Um, and that's what we're rooted in. I'm curious where you see college football specifically, but more college sports going. I, I don't think any of us are na naive enough to say that college football is what it used to be. College football has changed. Yeah. And, and I think college football has changed permanently. This isn't something we're going back to. With teams leaving for different conferences, with the idea of the expansion of playoffs, I mean, are we looking at super conferences? Are we looking at, like, what, what is the, what are we heading towards? And, and I don't know that you can necessarily answer that for everybody, but what do you think might be the best model for it going forward? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm worried, to be honest with you. Um, you know, one of the things that's been great about college athletics is a place like Oregon where we can provide 450 student athletes with an opportunity to get an education and compete at the highest level. As we see it become more and more about resources, those are going to be directed towards revenue generating sports, mm. and that's going to have an impact um, you know, on Olympic sports, yeah. on Team USA, yeah. on the Olympic movement in here. Uh, so, you know, I hope at some point through the chaos, you know, we can we can understand the great role that college athletics has played for a long time mm -hmm. and find that happy medium. I have fully supported name, image, and likeness and will continue yeah. to. Um, but I think we need to keep our focus on the fact that, you know, at Oregon there are 450 student athletes, 20 teams that benefit. And football is that economic engine. Yep. And we need to be able to have football to, cont to continue to help us support those other 19 teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get some insight for a minute if we can. I don't know if you can answer this, but what's on the table next for the facilities? I mean, when you look at Oregon's facilities, it's just a unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A what, spaceship. We're going to be spaceship. floating. What's it's going to be floating yeah. above. Yeah. What, what, what's uh, next? Well, uh, you now, know, maybe you can't answer that. Yeah. Maybe. No, obviously we've been we, we've been a leader. We'll continue to be a leader. You know, there's some debate. You know, has that piece of the game changed yeah. because yeah. of NIL? Right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's still important. We've been ahead with the, the Mariota Center. Um, you know, obviously the HDC. And you've seen the plans for, a, for an additional indoor practice facility. Uh, the Mashovsky Center is our most used facility in all of Oregon athletics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we get to where we can build uh, another indoor practice facility uh, that will be the best in the world, um, it, it, if done, uh, it, it does free up the Mashovsky Center. So that's probably the most front and center right, right now. Right. And if you don't have the land, you can always build a spaceship and put it above the Mashovsky Center. <laughs> if you, if you, you know, can't, if you, land rights, right. if you, you know. Can't go, if yeah. you can't go horizontal, yeah. go vertical. There you go. <laughs> Last question for I know you got a lot of hands to shake down there. Is there a conversation that you have with Dan Lanning after the season and you guys just privately take an evaluation of the program? And if so, is there anything you can share with us from that? Yeah, we do that with every program, right? Because, you know, that debrief kind of when you're mm -hmm. close enough to it at the end of the year to really say, hey, what went well, 
um, you know, what can we do to reach our goals? And, and Dan and I absolutely did sit down because we're in a rapidly changing environment. Mm -hmm. Just here a couple of weeks ago, the NCAA changed rules. And you know, there's some rules that got sent back to the NCAA Football Oversight Committee about what analysts can do. They may be able to coach on the field now. And oh. so you know, we're, we're constantly having that conversation about what do you think's gonna happen? If the rule goes this way, what do we do? If it goes that way, what do we do? Um, and so we did have the debrief. And what I'll share is that Dan was blown away by the support that he had. Um, by how the community rallied around him, by what a great um, you know, home field advantage Otson is. Um, and this is a place that, you know, he absolutely believes that he can deliver all the goals that we all have. And so, you know, it's, it's a process. Yeah. Um, and we're, we're through step one of that process. Yeah. Well, from all of us here, you've done an amazing job yeah. of directing the ship in some seas that continue to be chaotic. So best of luck with everything. Appreciate your time. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate what you do. Yeah, yeah thanks, absolutely. Guys. Appreciate it. All right, don't go anywhere. When we come back, the guys will join me and we'll hear more about the guys' thoughts on Rob Mullins and the sustained success here at Oregon. Plenty more Talking Ducks when we come back. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Time now for What's Cooking, brought to you by Sam's Northwest Barbecue, located just southwest of Portland and Newburgh, your home for Yoder Smoker products and so much more. And guys, welcome to the show, by the way. Aaron Fentress from the Oregonian, Anthony Newman, and of course, Joey Harrington. Any takeaways from our conversation with Rob Mullins, and what do you make about football sustained success despite five different head coaches over Rob's 10 years here at Oregon? Um... You know, honestly, I, I think that speaks to what he has been able to foster um, and in terms of a, a, I don't want to say a culture, uh, an environment, as the athletic director, while still paying attention to the budget, right? Let, let's not forget that this is a man who is, you know, deals with numbers, but also has to understand relationships and how the numbers fit with the people. Um, and, and I think that Oregon has been in a really unique position because that foundation, that culture, that family, those people are so strong. They're so committed. They, um, there's, there's truly a belief in, in continuing to foster that. And at the same time, I mean, let's, let's be honest and call a spade a spade. Like we have one of the most impactful donors um, in college football, right? So when you combine those two things, a, a foundation of culture and family that has been established for such a long time with um, somebody who's so involved in the program and wants to see success and is willing to help finance that, when you get a guy like Rob who's able to bridge those two worlds and make it all work, it, it just makes sense that they've been able to sustain that type of um, success, even though we've had coaches coming and going over the last few years. I made it clear a long time ago, I didn't think they should have fired the staff that they fired. But that being said, when you do something like that, which was a big decision, you put yourself in a position where, okay, well, now you have to hire someone else. And not only has he had to hire someone else, he's had to hire someone else and then someone else. And that's tough to do. And I think he, he hit on all three hires. I think Taggart would have done well at Oregon had he not left after a year. But when Taggart did do that, that just really turned everything upside down for, for Mullins. And he didn't panic. Like, he didn't freak out and go, oh, my God, I got to do another national search. He said, wait a minute. Let me just look at what I have here. I have two former head coaches on my staff. The players love Mario Cristobal. Mario Cristobal is definitely head coach material. I'm just going to make the decision to stay within. And that was a great choice. So then Mario leaves. And so now you have to start over again. Again, he didn't panic. He didn't freak out. He went out. He identified an up-and-coming young potential star coach and got him to Oregon. So you have to admire the dexterity there on his part to sort of, you know, calm things down, recalibrate and go out and make a good hire. Because that's, that's not an easy thing to do three times. So he deserves a lot of credit for that for sure. I, I think you got a good point there. And is, is, is Rob has never been someone to panic, right? He's no matter when you see him or what, like he never gets too high, never gets too low. Like there's, there's a very pragmatic nature about, um, about Rob, which I think has, to your point, has has really helped him in what has been a pretty um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? Turnover full. Um, <laughs> the most, you know, the most change in, in the history of Oregon football. And, and that type of approach has, has really benefited them. All right, guys, plenty more when we come back. Verone McKinley will join us from signing night live the other day, and he'll let us know more about how his rookie season went and what he expects in year two. More Talking Ducks when we come back. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Welcome back. Well, Verone McKinley, many people remember one of the absolute studs of this Oregon team a couple years ago, had a very surprising rookie season for the Miami Dolphins. So we had a chance to catch up with him at Signing Night Live and learn more about how his first year in the NFL went, his thoughts on Oregon since he's left the pond now, and what he thinks about the current state of the program. Here's our conversation with Verone McKinley. Well, we are here with Verone McKinley, and if we didn't get it on camera, but Joey Harrington basically cried in front of you, just saying that he wishes you were his son. It was like he was watching his own child out there playing, and really, but really just gushed about. I think you, I think you exemplify everything that former players and fans love seeing in an Oregon player. And I guess my question is. What was it about Oregon that you had so much pride about stepping onto that field and recognizing the privilege and the opportunity you had day in and day out to wear that helmet, and wear that uniform and compete? Um, I would say around COVID time, mm -hmm. when the game gets taken away from you, it puts things into perspective. We're not, we're all at home, we're not doing anything, we don't know what's gonna happen with the season and you really start to reflect and see how do I want to make an impact? I already knew going to Oregon, it was all about making an impact, being different, creating my own legacy. My parents went to Texas Tech. I left, went far from home. And so going into that COVID year, I knew right then and there, look, I got to step up. Some guys have opted out. And it just, in all facets of it, understanding that I want to graduate early, I want to be able to have options before we even get to the, the NFL or anything like that. And then just knowing that on the field, I got to be somebody that guys can count on. And that's where yeah. kind of the, the general and all that came on. And, that's just how I felt and something I've been raised and instilled. So. Yeah. Um, to expand more about what he said, what Joey said, Joey is basically saying that someone like you with the attitude you brought, the leadership you brought, is something that resonates with the old timers, right? Yeah. Who, want who want players in the program, who respect the program and are respectable. Um, as a leader at Oregon, what did you try to leave behind for the youngsters coming up behind you in that regard? to do everything right. Like it, it starts from the moment you wake up, from going to class, going to tutoring, workouts, nutrition, and then just understanding the playbook. And just being somebody that, if it's a janitor, if it's a teacher, when people ask about you, they're gonna say he did things right. He was somebody who came in with a positive attitude, always trying to help people out, and just, you wanna be that role model. Because I had guys who were like that in front of me. And so just taking all of that and understanding that there's guys who have come before me and make sure you pay homage to them in the way you approach your day to day. Well, first of all, welcome to the NFL family as a DB, <laughs> fellow DB. I appreciate uh, it. <laughs> I knew he, he played was thirteen make it. years. Yeah, yeah, that's you. I, I locked up Jerry Rice. It's, it's a one. It's a no, no, one. I was chasing Jerry Rice. You were chasing Jerry Rice. <laughs> okay, but but you, you talked about this, and, and I think your dad was a coach, right? Your dad's a coach, and and it, it was it was I think beneficial for you as a youngster to understand that, and and play the game with your brain, not just your body. How does that help you in the NFL? Because the NFL, everybody's fast. Everybody's explosive. Uh, it's all about the mental game, making those mistakes, understanding the game, understanding your oppo opponent. How does that help you in the NFL? I would say that understanding defenses, schemes, complex, um, all, of, all of that, that's one of the biggest parts of the NFL. Because if you don't know your job, for one, you're not going to be there long. You're definitely not going to play. So. Being able to do your 111 was huge, but be, being a safety and somebody who likes to learn everything, that just helped me really take that step in being that I'm I'm not worried as to who I'm playing against. Because like you said, everybody is good. This isn't this isn't everybody's good. Week in and week out, you're playing somebody that is trying to embarrass you. And so <laughs> making sure that I know what to do, who's doing what, where I need to be is all a big part of the grand scheme of trying to make sure you get off the field, drive in and drive out. <laughs> I'm curious, what was it like for the team coming out of that COVID year, getting back to normalcy? I know there were tons of conversations at the time that you probably talked to people about, but as we look back at that, it felt like some programs really were decimated by that COVID year and haven't recovered. How did this team 
rise up from that and continue to maintain such a high level of play when you look back at that experience? Oh, man. I think we stayed together as, as a team. There wasn't anybody. We weren't divided because we did things when we could outside of just working out. We tried to go and you know explore Oregon and just make sure we stayed together because we were already with each other all the time anyways. Nobody was on campus. There's nobody. So we were with each other all the time. And I think that was a big piece of knowing when we came back from even after the 2020 year, the guys who were, are coming back for another year, we knew we had the guys. It's not like we didn't have the talent. We just got to put the pieces together. And so I think that was why we were able to continue to be somewhat successful in the next year is because we were have that camaraderie. So. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the NFL. So you had a year left on the table, but you decided to go pro. Didn't get drafted, but you worked your butt off to get to a point where you played 10 games as an undrafted rookie, yeah. which is not usual. Tell us about your, your journey from the draft to playing for the Dolphins. There's no time to, to sulk or woe is me because football is fluid and it's going to move with or without you. So me getting an opportunity to go play in Miami, it was all about just understanding that you have an opportunity. and. You're not, I don't want to waste this opportunity. No matter what happens, I know I'm going to put my best foot forward. And whatever the results are, we'll live with it. And so when I you know, get those opportunities in camp and in, in games and preseason, and then you, know, you make the team and you get to get in those games early on, it's like, look, you're out here. There's no reason to, to be worried or be scared. You need to go and do your job because this veteran who's been here eight years is counting on me to do my part. And I feel like that is huge and just understanding that you have an opportunity and that you know I've been blessed to have a lot of people around me who've helped me keep that positive attitude and understand that you know to make the most out of every moment. How real quick, how, how helpful was it to land in a place where your boy was there? Yeah. <laughs> like you, you get picked up as a free agent and oh yeah, boy. Javon Holland's there. Hey what's up homie? I mean what was that like? It, for one of course that's your best friend it just made it a lot smoother for me to be able to not just on the field and understand the defense that I was about to learn, but off the field, understanding how to navigate through Miami. Miami's a fast, wild place. I'm just be honest with you. But understanding <laughs> how to keep your head on straight, how to navigate through it, and to make sure that what's important is is being the main focus. Always keep the main thing. The main thing is what we've always said. And him being there has helped me do that. And then getting the opportunity when you're you're playing with each other, you can play off each other. You've already had that chemistry. So we're on the field and we're we're trying to disguise or show different looks. We're not afraid to do that because we've done it before. It's funny, I think you get to brag a little bit because your DB class, you have some dudes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, and, and they're playing in the NFL dudes. right now. I mean, you, so in college playing with these guys, I mean, it was, that's, that's unusual to play with that many. I mean, and, and also next to Javon, Javon and all those guys. But talk about the NFL guys, the, the DBs in the NFL. These are some guys who can play, could do all the different things. You're a guy who can play all different positions. They're kind of moving you all over the place a little bit. You're playing all special teams. How was that like? How was that like going out playing against guys who can play all these different positions as well as they got you kind of moving around uh, doing the same thing? It makes it fun. Being we were in the defense, I got to blitz. I got yep. to, you know, cover running backs, cover tight ends. Yep. You play middle of the field, halves, quarters. Like being able to do all that and doing it in college just helps you. And so yes. having other DBs around you who can do different things, that's what makes the NFL special because you have so many guys that are yep. versatile. And that just adds value. You always want to bring more and more value to the table. So me going into year two, knowing that I've been through those experiences for year one, I've played different positions, I've done different things. I'm excited because I know the type of player I am and I know I've showcased it, so it's time to continue to elevate. I said before, year one is like, you know, you get your feet wet, you understand the league and how things work. Year two, you got to take that next step. Yep. So. Yep. Do you get to hang out with Mario Cristobal ever? I've talked to him a couple times. During the season, I couldn't really just because we were both busy, but yeah. for sure I know when I go back uh, after this, I'm definitely going to connect with him. He's somebody who's very, very known in Miami. So. Who pays yeah, for lunch yeah. when you go out? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Who pays I don't for know lunch? if anybody yeah. will pay because he's so he's so well known down there. So. Wow, that's crazy. All right, two questions to end on. Every player, I feel like, no matter how confident you are, no matter how cool you are coming into the NFL, there's always that starstruck moment when you line up against another player. You know, for me, it's Champ Bailey lining up against him. Did you have that moment this season at any point? So. Our, we, our first joint practice was against Tampa. Oh. <laughs> so I see Tom Brady, and I, I luckily, I got to do it. They practiced before we even yeah. got there, so I had my moment before I'll we even got on the field. Person. <laughs> it's just knowing that it's Tom Brady. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when the season started, it was Aaron Rodgers. Like, oh, oh, yeah, there you for go. one, he, it's, he dialed us up. Like I mean, I've never seen somebody make throws like this in my life. Like Fading to the left, just throws it, no just hip torque, nothing into it. 
And then after the game, I dapped him up, and I was like, man, that's Aaron Rodgers. And I was telling my parents after, like, man, I dapped up Aaron Rodgers. He was like, keep working, young fella. Well, that's good, good stuff. Just a cool dude. That's good so, stuff. That's I love it. And then stuff. last question. That's good stuff. You know, again, you're one of those guys that embodies exactly what Oregon's trying to do in recruiting. Bring in a player from out of state, right, that can come in and have a tremendous impact on the program. Now the playing field's been very even. Everybody's got uniforms. Everybody's got facilities. Why Oregon? Why was it a great fit for you? And why should it be a great fit for the next Varel McKinley coming in? I think, for one, because it's different. Eugene, Oregon, Nike, all of those things you can't get everywhere else. I think it's different from that standpoint. I think it's different because of the people. People mm. were a big part of why I came here and why I love it so much because I've met so many people over the course of my time being here. And even now, I still meet more and more people. Yeah. And then just a place where you're going to play in big games. That's mm -hmm. that's kind of what you pride yourself on. You're going to play in big games, and we've produced pros. There's three reasons right there why you should come to Oregon. All right, Barone. Well, I appreciate it, man. Best of luck with everything. We're very proud of you and uh, appreciate the time. And we'll let you go ahead and continue to be starstruck by some of those quarterbacks. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Hey, absolutely. All right, stick around. When we come back, the guys will chime in on Barone's conversation. They'll also let us know some of their all-time favorite ducks. Yes, we'll see if Joey Harrington makes that list. Plenty more when we come back. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Time now for our legendary moment, brought to you by Abby's Legendary Pizza. And who could forget this game-sealing pick by Verone McKinley on the road, in the horseshoe, at Ohio State. I believe it's the last time Ohio State has lost a home game, but obviously one of the more memorable wins in Oregon history. And so, guys, how do you remember Verone McKinley when you look at his charisma and impact on the field? And while we're on the subject of favorite Ducks, I'm curious, I've never really asked you guys this question, but besides moi, yours truly, who is your favorite all-time Oregon Duck? Let's get started with you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, let's go to me first, because clearly no one on the set knows more about playing safety than I do. Uh, so let's just... <laughs> no, the thing about Verone, look, when you have a safety who is that intelligent, it just covers up so many things and it just makes things so much more difficult for the offense because they're not going to be able to manipulate you as well as they want to. All, passing offense is all about manipulating the secondary and getting them to do one thing and then having guys cutting elsewhere and the quarterback's got to make the read. But Verone was so good back there at, trying, at keeping things organized and keeping the IQ at a high level that it just made that difficult. And that's always fun to watch if you're really into the X's and O's of football and see a safety who can manipulate things like that. So, and plus his leadership, clearly he, he got guys going. He got guys going in the right direction. He, he fixed things. People followed his lead. So he was, he was a lot of fun to watch. As far as my favorite duck, I mean, Marcus is too easy, right? Everyone loves Marcus. But I'm going to go with my main man here, Dennis Dixon. There's a rookie card of Dennis Dixon right here. I'm going to go with him because in 2005, I attached myself to him. I told everybody, Dennis is going to contend for the Heisman in 2007. I was mocked by people in the media and fans for two years until 2007 when he had it in his hands. It still crushes me to this day that he got injured because he had that thing and I had called it two years prior. But Dennis is my dude. Anthony, why don't you go? You, you, you go next. Well, you know, talking about Verone, I, I, I think he doesn't get enough credit because he was in the backfield with Javon Holland. You know, and Javon Holland's a stud and, and a high draft pick. But Verone, uh, Aaron, you're right. I mean, he plays with his brain. And there was a great defensive back told me a long time ago, if, if you want to play fast and play for a long time, you play with your brain first and then your body will follow. Uh, your brain can get you there faster than your body. And as you get older, your body won't get you there as fast. So, so you got to use your brain. Verone McKinley uses his brain. I mean, that's how he plays the game. That's his asset. He, uh, and I think also being around his dad, who's a football coach, understanding the game. So uh, he's a big-time player. My all-time favorite duck, this is going to be a surprise to you guys because it's on the defensive side. Maybe that's not a surprise. That's not a surprise but at all. <laughs> It's Patrick Chung. Okay. okay because Patrick yeah. Chung was, he's one I of the best I was going to say Chad Coda. I thought you were going Chad Coda. No, Chad Coda was my ball boy when I was in high school. He's not, <laughs> he's not, I'm not going with Chad Coda. I'm going with Patrick Chung because Patrick Chung was, was a safety before the safeties really came out. That hybrid safety. The guy can do it all. He, he's one of the best safeties ever to play at Oregon. Uh, I, I got really close to him. I was playing here. Maybe that's why he's my favorite. 
but he was a baller, and then he played, what, 11 years in the NFL and has, what, three Super Bowl rings with the Patriots. So uh, he, he, he's, he, he's a guy that if I'm going to, you know, I have a football team, I'm going to pick my defensive players, he's number one. Makes sense. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. Um, I, I think you guys both make great points about um, about Verone. And by the way, we we didn't address that you guys kicked me off of the the interview um, panel. You know, didn't allow me to share my feelings on camera, so I had to share them uh, off camera. Um, Verone is the guy. You said it. You said it, Anthony. He played with his head, but he also played with his heart, right? And those are the guys that that you want to follow when you're on a team. Those are the, those are the true leaders. Like, you know, you guys have been around, around teams where you got the guy who's just extremely athletically talented, just the freak athlete, but he doesn't do the right things, right? He goes out and he makes that highlight play and then he's going to screw something up and run, run the ret next or the, the next route incorrectly because he wasn't paying attention, right? Verone is that guy that even when nobody's looking, he does the right thing. Every time, on the field, in the classroom, in the weight room. Um, and it comes across in the way he presents himself. And I had a chance to, to tell him before the interview that um, like that's the stuff that we as alums, as, as members of the football family, af- appreciate because he gets it. Like there's, there's something that, like there's something innate in, in him that if I was part of that team, I'd be, I'd be following him. Right. That's hey, I'm on, I'm on team Verone. Like, and those are the things that I think that make people so great. Like you can, Anthony, I can, I, I'm sure we could spend a half hour show telling me all the guys that are just unbelievably talented that never made it in the league. Oh, this guy was so fast or this guy was so strong or this guy could jump out of the gym, but there's certain guys that get it and certain guys that know how to do it and, and know how to get other people to do it with them. And that's, that's who Verone is for me. Um, in terms of my favorite duck, <sighs> Jordan Peele. What's that? Jordan Peele. <laughs> Jordan Peele or Justin Peele? Um, Sorry, Justin. Peele. Jordan Peele is the comedian, right? My bad. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, Sorry. Sorry, Justin. There you go. No, okay. I got it. I got it because I could go with Maurice or Ontario or like, you know, some of the Keenan Howery, um, Wes Mallard, but I play with those guys, right? So I'm going to have to go with one of. The few multi-sport athletes. However, our own Jordan Kent, last time I checked, did not make it to the Olympics. So I'm going oh, Devin your boy. Your Allen. Boy. Devin my Allen. guy that I've been talking about for like seven years. The guy I wish I could have thrown to. The guy who I was cheering from my, my couch uh, on the Oregon coast when I was watching him in the Olympics. Um, I mean, that guy's just, he, he just, he's, He's joy. Like, you can tell. Like, I'm going to do a little, little name drop here. You can, you know, pick it up. I had a chance to talk with Steve Kerr a couple weeks ago, and, and we, we asked him about, like, what does he teach and what does he want his team to embody? He says, I want them to be, I want them to embody competitiveness and joy. And that's what I get when I watch, when I watch Devin play and compete. Like, you can tell nobody is going to, like, there's a belief in himself that nobody is going to beat me. But while he does it, he has fun and he smiles and you can tell that he's enjoying every moment of it. So that's, those are the type of people I love to watch. Um, yeah, there you go. All right. Well, from one current NFL duck, when we come back, we'll take a look at some future NFL ducks. Six Oregon players getting combine invites to the NFL combine. We'll let you know our thoughts on that when we wrap up shop on Talking Ducks right when we come back. You're watching Talking Ducks, built by Par Lumber. Time now for our rock solid pick, brought to you by Milan Stoneworks, bringing you the finest stoneworks in all the Pacific Northwest. And six Oregon Duck players will be invited to the NFL Combine. That's headlined by Christian Gonzalez, Noah Sewell, and DJ Johnson, just to name a few. And guys, your thoughts on these guys and how they project to the NFL at the next level? Because Aaron, you look at, say, a guy like Noah Sewell, who coming in was that can't-miss first-round pick. He's kind of slid to the second round now, whereas Christian Gonzalez balled out this year, and now he's a name that you might hear called in the first 15 picks possibly. So I'm curious, where do you see these guys 
playing out as they start to hopefully get drafted. And Aaron, let's get rolling with you again. Yeah, Noah, Noah slipped from the, the fake mock drafts that don't mean anything leading up to the, when the NFL scouts actually get a hold of you and start really projecting things. Because uh, we all know a lot of those things can be inflated sometimes. But dude has every measurable you would want to be a successful linebacker, so I can't see him not having success at the next level. But is it to anyone's surprise that three of these guys are offensive linemen? Because that's what we talked about for two straight years with his team was the offensive line. So no surprise there. What is interesting to me, though, is that notice that of the six, four are transfers. Only two high school guys. Uh, and that despite having some pretty deep recruiting classes. So that is a little interesting. You'd like to see more high school recruits develop within the program and get to the NFL. Interesting. interesting. Who t- what am I missing here? Forsyth? <laughs> Forsyth no, and uh, Sewell. Sewell. And Sewell. Are the only two high school recruits. God, Bass and Sala are, are, and Johnson and Gonzalez You're right. are all transfers. You're right. And last everybody year you only had one high school in. recruit drafted, and that was – Kayvon, I think he was the only player drafted. So you're looking at two seasons where at, at most you're having three recruits despite having top 10 or top 12 classes for a few years there. So it's pretty that's, interesting. I mean, that's, that, that's an interesting point, one that I hadn't thought of. But, but again, like comes back to our point every year that like <laughs> you, you can never predict – what a high school kid is going to end up being in four years. There are so many things that go into this. Um, and so I, I think, yeah, you guys can touch on all the, the athletic stuff and, you know, Anthony talk about being a, a, a DB and, and what Gonzalez is and everything he brings. But I've been saying it all year that a guy like Alex Forsyth is, is the type of rock that you will need on an NFL roster, right? He's that guy that gets in, that's maybe a a mid to late round pick and comes in maybe as a backup somewhere, you know, finds his his way onto a roster and then just grinds and just does it over and over and over and over to the point where those coaches who see him every single day can't help but say, we got to find a way to get this guy into the lineup, right? In the NFL, you work with eight offensive linemen. And so there's interchanging going on all the time. How can we, you know, how can we cut somebody's salary, move somebody in? How can we adjust this, trade somebody over here, draft this guy? And Alex Forsyth, to me, is the type of guy that can literally anchor an offensive line for, you know, for a decade. Like th- that, that is the type of guy that I would want to be my center uh, if, I was, if I was an NFL quarterback still. Well, it's funny, you know, you talk about the – the, the combine and, and, and the combine can, can help you, you know, and people say, well, it could also hurt you, but yeah, but after the combine, there's a pro day and you can make up for the combine at the pro day, but the combine, if you get invited to the combine, doesn't mean you're going to get drafted. It means that you get to perform in front of all these NFL scouts, uh, the GMs, the head coaches, assistant coaches uh, in person. And that's what they want to see. So it, it can help you move up the ranks when I talk about moving up the ranks, uh, that's that's a financial situation. Hey, it, I'm not a, a, a fourth round draft pick. I'm a second round draft pick or a late first round draft pick. The money's a whole lot different uh, when you do that. Uh, I was fortunate that to, to move my stock up by because of the the combine, and that was because of I had a great trainer training me for the combine, Jimmy Radcliffe. I didn't have to fly somewhere to Arizona or to Texas to train. He was in my backyard in Eugene, so I trained with him. And I went from a fourth rounder, a third rounder, to a, a, a top second round a draft pick. So it, 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 uh, it, it helped. I, I, I believe that these guys have a chance to improve their stock. I don't think it will hurt them, but they have a chance to improve their stock so these, play, these coaches can see them in person and see what matches up on film. By a guy out here running drills, does he look good? Well, I watch film. He looks good on the on on the on the field, also playing. Uh, if you get hurt by it, you run a bad forty. Make it up in the pro day. It's interesting you brought Anthony, up the matching. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm gonna say it's interesting you brought up the matching up on film because in the, when I when I cover draft stuff, I talk to scouts, and that's what they they always say is that they see you on film do certain things but they want to see some of it in person and see if it matches, right? See if it matches that. Okay, I see you look explosive on the field in a game, but let me see it in person because maybe what I'm seeing in the game isn't exactly what I think it is based on competition or what have you. Then you see it, you can match it. The other thing is when they measure the explosiveness of certain things like vertical or the broad jump or whatever, you know, the 40, stuff like that, they take those numbers and times and they compare them to past 
uh, NFL pro bowlers and NFL starters and things like that and see how they match up that way. Because if you have a certain mediocre level of explosiveness coming out of the combine, then that's going to deteriorate for all players. So if you're starting at a middle-of-the-road place, you're going to deteriorate to the point where you're not going to be usable as opposed to someone who starts higher might deteriorate slower. So it's all pretty kind of fascinating. What I was going to say is, speaking of uh, seeing in person, it, was it just my experience, Anthony, or did you have to stand in your underwear on stage in front of like 500 people who were sitting there taking notes on what you looked like? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and turn around, uh, turn to your right, mm -hmm. uh, turn to your left. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that, yeah. Put your arms out. Put spread your arms out wide. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, you you're like a like a cattle getting moved through there, like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, standing up in your in your compression shorts, and literally as soon as you get on stage, everybody just goes like this. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like they're it's like the uh, you're the nude artist and they're sketching you and like ooh, we got a little bit of fat oh, on this yeah. side. Ooh, they need it. Yeah. Oh wait, no, need need and, and then it never goes away like Brady's combine picture, right? It never <laughs> goes away. But hey, but back then. You know, I was looking like Tarzan, so I didn't mind. <laughs> so you were good. <laughs> Numa was flexing. Yeah, like, you, you didn't have this? that problem. I had that problem. Numa was like, did you, did you catch this right here? You catch that? <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thanks again for jumping in. As always, when we return next week, we're going to have a little bit of a love story. Oregon's newest power couple. We have a sit-down interview with Hironis Grasso and Sabrina Unescu. You don't want to miss it. We'll let you know which Oregon Duck kind of helped spark that initial flame. But you got to wait till next week. That'll be on our next episode of Talking Ducks. From all of us here, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time.